the market's not looking for a new strategy from a construction company. They don't care. What you have to do is go backwards, right? What's the values of the business? What's the mission of the business? Then what's our strategy to get that done with the market knowledge of where we are and how big you can be? And then you go to structure. And then you start to have hard conversation with people you may have that may not fit the structure, but there's a good place for that person, right? Um, and that keeps it so much more objective than subjective um, as it relates to people. And then once you have the people down, you actually go to process last. And it's something people don't realize is you go to process and systems last once you have the right people in the right, right boxes. Scott Moss, thanks for coming on Masters of Moments. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you, brother. It's uh, it's great to see you. Uh, great to share some thoughts and uh, and sit with a hospitality thought leader. So this is going to be fun. I'm trying, but normally when I'm in your office, we're sharing a bottle of wine, which is always a nice treat. Yes, yes, uh, wine is always fun. So I thought a good place to start would be for you to kind of tell everyone how you ended up at a second generation construction business? Well, that's fun. Um, you know, my, my, my dad was a, uh, a corporate business, large commercial contractor CEO, uh, for a publicly traded company. And, uh, at 58, he retired, uh, kind of had some differences of opinion about how things should go in the corporate world and how people should be treated. And, so he left that business and uh, we started a business. Um, me, my brother, and my dad, uh, close to 20 years ago, it was just literally a computer. Uh, so when you say it's second generation, I would, I would uh, to use a wine reference, uh, it's more like a 1.5, uh, meaning I was here from the start and, uh, and to give Schaefer a plug, uh, there's, there's something called Schaefer 1.5. And that's because the son was there really close on to when the dad started the business. And so he always thought himself as a one and a half generation. That's kind of how I view me and my brother as well. And so the business started um, and I was in the construction business, actually the same business he was in. I was a project manager and at 30, uh, we started the business. And so uh, now I am here 20 years later. Uh, we started with roughly, uh, you know, three employees and a computer. And now we have uh, 1,400 salary employees and 2,800 hourly employees uh, from here to Hawaii, uh, South Florida, Hawaii. And it's a great story. Um, it's a great story where there's a, there's a lot of fathers in the story. When I say that, um, there's a lot of fathers of success. Uh, we had great, when we first started, we had you know, great four great uh, executives that helped start the business. And we've transitioned on now to where we're Moss 7.0. If you start back when we were Moss 1.0, it was way different. Um, so, um, but I, I, you know, to, to, for your original question is, uh, I took a drawing class in college and I really liked how drawing out a building really made you fall in love with the process of building. And so then I fell in love with building. So still in love with building, love to build buildings, love to build solar plants. It's a, it's a great, great profession. And I get to work with fantastic developers, uh, like you every now and again, Jake. I know I, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that you say 1.5 because I feel a very similar way with my dad. And you and I have talked a lot about working with our dads and, and building a business. And I don't think a lot of people can understand it unless they've done it in that way where you're building the business together with your dad. So what did 1.5 mean for you? So 1.5 means that you're there uh, from, the, from the early onset of the business. And, and, you know, it, when, when they say second generation, it's, it feels like there's like this big change that happens in the second generation and the third generation. And it means that there's some sort of transformation when really, um, you know, there, there really wasn't a transformation. It's more about a scaling effort, right? If you will. And I, I'm pretty familiar with your story as well, which is fantastic. And I would call it more about scale and how do you think kind of broader about hospitality business and, and, and modernize the hospitality business. Um, and so but for me, the 1.5 kind of resonate around how early on Chad and I were involved in the business. 
And how did you how's figure- it resonate, How's it resonate for you? How's it resonate well, for you for one point? In that, in that way, because I felt like when I came into the business, my dad had built something great that we could leverage off of, but there really wasn't anything for me to do if I didn't create it for myself. And for me, I felt a huge obligation and desire for my own personal needs to kind of build the business with him because there wasn't a role that I could just step in and be comfortable. Those roles were already done because it was a smaller business. So how did you figure out with your dad who was going to do what when you're starting a business with your dad? Because, you know, it's your dad. There's a respect thing. There's an age thing. That's great. That's a great question. Um, when we, when we first started, um, you know, my dad came from a very large CEO role. Uh, so he was working off his non-compete. And so there was a lot of positions open when you're starting a business, right? The marketing department, uh, had nobody over it because I was the marketing department, the accounting department, um, operations, you know, so, so there was a clean slate. Um, and then as those four really competent executives came aboard, um, I found myself in a role where I had to help the business be a great business. And so you do that via systems and do that, making sure you have the right thought process on, on how we're going to do things and what's our rhythm and rigor going to be and how we're going to communicate to, you know, at, at the, at the peak before, before we got smaller, we were like 350 employees. Um, and then we shrunk down to 140. So the story is more interesting to actually hear that in 2011, we were doing $175 million and we had 142 people working here, right? So in roughly 12 years later, we have 10 times the people working here and we're going to do 3 billion in 2023. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of scale with what's happened over the next past 12 years. Um, but when we first started, there was so much to do and, uh, the four really good executives and my father were good at selling. And so there's someone need to be in the back end of it to figure out what does this business look like three and four and five years ago, five years from then. And when you kind of think about a working ship, um, think about a working deck of an old pirate ship, if you will. And my dad had the operations kind of down. He loves, he loves the operations, right? So he's got the working deck, right? And my brother likes a good time and a party and to entertain people. So he had the galley. And then the only place really left open was, was the crow's nest. And so I had to climb up in the crow's nest. It's not my normal uh, thought process to be a strategic quote unquote person, even though I hate that word. Um, but really, where is the company visionary going to go? from a long-term perspective. And is this, is this a uh, lifestyle business that we're, we're only going to grow as much as we want to deal with, or is this business in perpetuity? And so we chose the latter uh, is the business is in perpetuity and the business isn't just here for this generation or my son's generation, but this business is set up for a, the long-term kind of a, more of an infinite thought process. In 2011, when I guess that was when you were maybe shrinking, did you have the same mentality and thought process or has that completely evolved along the way? Yeah, I, it was in 2009 to 10, because we don't work as a construction company. You know what your next year is going to look like because you've sold work, right? So we knew we were going to shrink. And uh, in 2010, we installed like a, a million and a half dollar or $2 million um, ERP. And I remember one of the four exe top executives uh, came in and said, are you sure we want to do that right now? I said, well, if the plan is to close shop in four or five years, no, I don't want to do that. But if the plan is to have a long-term business, then yes, I want to invest to have the right system. So when we, it scales back up, we can scale along with it. And uh, lo and behold, uh, that ERP came in really handy when we took over two companies. We did two M&As. Uh, in, in 12 or no, in 13 and 14. Without that system, the M&A would have been much tougher. Um, so as I would say we got lucky on that one. That, that investment paid off quickly. Um, it's probably a it's mistake. Still, Go ahead. It, it's probably the system, the system we still have up and running uh, 12 years later too, or, or 14 years later. So, A lot of companies probably wouldn't have made that type of investment and then they would have missed the merger and acquisition. How did you, at the time, justify that expense? Well, um, 
you know, the justification came on a, a couple, a couple of different things. Um, first, our current ERP accounting system said, you're going to have to pay us a million dollars or we're going to stop supporting it. So that, that company then forced me to choose what, what software I wanted to move to. So when there's kind of a little choice, then, then, then you, then you say, okay, now, now if I have to make a choice, let's, what's the choice I want for more of the long term? And so an impetus really pushed, pushed on that. I, I'm so happy they made me make that choice um, because it really helped us out in the long term. Yeah. So I had a little built in kind of rationale. Yeah. I suspect it was more than that. You knew where you knew where you wanted to go. It seems like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we and early on in twenty twenty ten uh, twenty eleven is when I was named president. So, so those top four executives got, uh, you know, we only had two of them left. Unfortunately, two had left by that point, point. Um, and uh, so they got a new boss uh, that was that was probably fifteen years younger than they were, uh, and uh, and so then. Uh, systems. I, I was a more of a systems guy. And so then I started getting a little bit more detailed about the expectations of the organizations as it relates to how much, how much work should we, should we do out of South Florida? How much work should we do outside of South Florida? And so then some, some goals were put in place uh, that made some, some people uncomfortable because it started to draw a little bit of a line in the sand about what are we going to be in the future? So let's prepare to be that in the future. And, uh, each year, amazingly, uh, we exceed those kind of goals and expectations, uh, as you kind of march toward, you know, something greater and something with growth. Um, so yeah, so I, I changed the rules a little bit as, re- as it relates to, um, you know, this business is working for us and, and now we kind of work for the people inside the business. That's kind of how I view my role. Um, it's a little bit different, a little bit different thought process. And that's where my, my, our leadership team. Uh, thinks the same way now. Are you planning your goals five years out, or are you setting these every year? Uh, we like our our long term goals are probably in the three to four. Maybe we'd stretch to five. Hard to see what the market's going to do. I mean, I don't need to tell you how how dynamic the market is right now. Uh, with lending is what it is. Uh, with uh, rental rates either growing or shrinking, depending where you are, or um, or the desire to live someplace. Uh, you and I happen to be live in a great place where, where the demographics are changing quickly, where people are moving to South Florida, Tampa, and and Dallas, and so we happen to have offices there, right there, right now, and all those construction markets are are booming. Um, so it's kind of easy to forecast long term when it's that when it's more sh- when it's when it's showing negative, it's kind of hard to do uh, two three year. You start to do year by year and start to figure out. How do you, how do you recorrect uh, the organization for the what market you're in? And how did the landscape, we're going to talk about the business, but how did the landscape generally in the construction industry and down here in South Florida and the markets that you operate change from like 2011 to, to now, which has been the time where you just have grown like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 175 million to 3 know, billion. First... Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Um, it's the real deal. A couple of things. Yeah. A couple of things to think about, uh, over the 20 year period. Now there's no other, well, you're in the restaurant business too. And so you, we're, we're of this group where you're number one in the businesses that go under in the restaurant business. And the number two businesses that don't make it is construction. And, uh, both are, um, you know, both have their interesting, at, you know, aspects to them. And ours happens to be a low margin business that if you don't pay attention to every little detail, it'll eat you alive. Right. Um, and, and so when you think about the 20 year expansion of just South Florida, there's been 13 large contractors that have gone under in 20 years. So think about since just since we inception, uh, there's been 13 rather large contractors that have gone under. I don't know the numbers from, uh, from 2011 to today, um, I would say our competition has shrunk over the past over the past uh, probably uh, you know 12 years, and not a lot of trade, not a lot of big CM firms have come into 
uh, South Florida and Tampa. Just just a different place to operate. Uh, we're a newcomer in Dallas, and so we are uh, we're probably not you know not as well known, uh, but we're making some significant headway to get market share there. And and then when you think about the growth of you know you know 175 million to three billion, we also have a utility scale solar business uh, where we do everything once civil work is done, uh, drive the pile, put the metal put the metal together, and install the install the module, uh, install all the electrical work. So we have our own electricians on payroll. So all those people are a Moss payroll person, and we do that from Nevada to Virginia to South Florida. And so you have these kind of you have these five businesses, if you will, and we also do work in Hawaii. So um, so that's how you get to that. We really diversified over those of those twelve years. We were heavy, heavy um, South Florida centric in 20, 2011. and now we're much more diversified than we were uh, back then. So do most of these other guys go under because they're not diversified and they're just building condos for one developer and. Yeah, I think I think there's a many reasons why. Uh, everything from uh, a divorce, uh, because you have to remember if you have to keep a lot of equity in these businesses, and so when someone's equity gets split in half, they lose their bonding, and then all of a sudden they're out of business. Um, so it, it, it can be anything. If like a divorce, it could be anything from where private equity decided not to be in the business anymore and takes all the money out of the business, um, and and poof, uh, that contract was gone. Um, two of them were were foreign owned contractors that decided not to be in the South Florida or not to be in the construction business in the U S at all. And so they just pulled, pulled all the way out. Um, one is a very large contractor where the, the head of this region, um, was, if you will, not taking the losses in the proper years. And so trying to is pushing losses forward and forward and forward. And one day, uh, you know, the, the rag came off the cabbage and then, uh, that, that, that company shrunk in South Florida dramatically. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a multitude of reasons. There's, there's many things that go wrong, just like a restaurant, right? Um, you know, did, did, did they, did they, did they, were they too loose with the inventory and then too much cash left via the grocery, grocery bag or, or did you not charge enough or, or did you pay your people too much? I mean, you, t- you tell me how a restaurant struggles. In every which way, all of the above and, you know, the next question, if you have a successful restaurant is I want to do another one, or if you have a successful hotel, you want to build another one. So when you're going into these other markets, how do you identify that that's something you want to be? Take Dallas, for example. Why did you pick Dallas? And what have you been doing to make a name for yourself? Yeah. Um, so in 2014, uh, I mentioned we did one m and uh, We had a, a company come in and buy a minority share of our business. At the same time, um, they gave us a construction company. They gave us a construction company with roughly 70, 80 people in it. It was based in El Paso, San Diego, and Hawaii. So that's how we ended up with Hawaii. And uh, when we looked at El Paso as a market, we felt like that wasn't going to be a good long-term market where we believe that uh, construction is a regional business. And so uh, that team decided, yes, we want the challenge to go and set up a camp in, um, uh, in Dallas. And that was four years ago. And so just imagine four years ago, four or five years ago with COVID. And so, uh, so tough, tough time to move. Uh, hard to meet people. Job. Hard to meet people via Zoom, right? Um, and what that team has a unique skill set. And so there's two things that get built there a lot, uh, 20 and 30 story high rises and stick built multifamily. So we built, we only do stick built multifamily in Dallas because it's unique to Dallas. Our team had a deep understanding of that and deep knowledge of it. So they went in and started that way. And then we've added on a commercial and we're, we're starting our second uh, kind of 25 story uh, high rise downtown in, in Dallas right now. And that's, that's one way we're making a name for ourselves. Um, we got the first job because another contractor went out of business and we were the ones able to stand there and, uh, and get a bond and, and get it done. Um, but that's, uh, that, that, that story on that contractor, it would be a fascinating business case. I hope someone writes it one day. Uh, but it's a story of Katera and how, uh, really smart oh. money from Silicon Valley was going to disrupt the, uh, disrupt the construction uh, industry. Um, so 
Um, so a little uh, story. So lost. It, I had a uh, a good friend of mine who is incredibly wealthy, and we went out to Silicon Valley to meet with Katera, actually. And we sat in this big boardroom. He was thinking about making an investment. And, you know, I have a little bit of construction knowledge. I've messed some things up along the way. I know how to make mistakes. I know the problems. And I also know my good friend, Scott Moss. So you've taught me a lot. And I'm sitting here in the meeting and just listening to these Katera guys just simplify how easy everything is with construction, how they can make every single component in their own house and how they can build in any market. And I started asking him questions like, well, what about in Florida where you have hurricane codes and every single, oh, no, no, that's not a problem. But what about in California where you have all this entitlement risk and you can't just you know, go online and get a permit? Oh, we, we have that figured out with an algorithm. And then all of a sudden, yeah, boom, they went poof. So what do people then think of you? How do you think your, I guess, customers think about Moss? Wow, that's a that's a great question. How do our how do my customers think about us? I I, I feel like um, the best compliment you can ever give somebody that's providing a service, and that's what we are. We're a service provider. Uh, is that you buy the second and third and fourth building with them, and so most of our most of our clients uh, are are ninety percent PP clients. And you say, well, how how can that be? Like, uh, let's take the Marlins, for example. Uh, we helped, we were part of the JV that built the Marlins ballpark. And then when they had a renovation, who did they call? They called us to do a renovation. So um, that kind of gives you a good indication about how the experience was. They could depend on the work getting done, and they knew that they were going to get communicated uh, too clearly. So I think that that is the most important thing. And, and, and in construction, I feel like the schedule is the most important thing. Um, because then that gives everybody the predictability about when they can monetize the asset. And when you talk about monetize the asset, you, you, it sounds like you're talking about something people are going to sell, like a condo or no, no, apartments they monetize, hotels they monetize, the dorm is going to monetize. They can't teach in a building that's not finished, so they're going to monetize that building. So, so everything that is a physical asset ends up being some sort of financial instrument that serves a purpose. And so if you, if our team is all about closing, like it's super important to close every single issue so you can close the CEO or the CO, the certificate occupancy, so then they can use the building, right? Um, so I, I hope uh, our, our, our clients feel like that we have a sense of urgency for, uh, for their financial instrument to, to be used as soon as possible. I love that. Every hard conversation is easy when you have a CO, when you don't have a CO, it's not a fun conversation. So one of the worst, um, then you got to get there. You got to get there. One of the worst mistakes I ever made in business. Okay. One of the, the worst mistakes I ever made in business. You probably know what I'm going to say is not hiring you for a job. So <laughs> that, that, I that, bring that up. I, I, well, that turned out to be, up. you brought it up. Just remember I, I'm opening this door, um, but along that setup, what are some mistakes that you see developers make all the time? Um, you know, I, I'm going to say one thing about my developer friends, and, and you're included in this. Um, they are amazing visionaries that risk a ton uh, to make these buildings happen. And, and actually as civilians, we get to enjoy them with no risk. Like, uh, like your bar at the top of, of the, of the Del Mar is, is, is one of the coolest things ever. Um, and, and, you know, looking at that, when I saw in the drawings, I'm like, wow, probably that probably won't go well, but sure enough, it's one of the coolest places ever. And, so I, as a, as, a, as a citizen around here, I get to enjoy it because you had great vision, right? And what people don't realize is what it takes to make that vision happen. Like all the capital you have to put up and then all the lawyers you have to meet with and all the things you have to sit through to get a, a bar at the top of a, a top of a building and no one wants to hear noise and you have to prove there's no noise and all that stuff. So, so first, my developer friends are amazing visionaries. 
And what ends up happening is uh, they get so in love with the project uh, that they want it to happen so bad, they will believe any number that helps them figure out their performer, right? Whether or not that that number is a solid number or or is a number that actually can actually can perform the work and is it is invested in the long term community, and I think that's one of the hardest parts developers have to kind of see through is 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 this person is is this contractor long term in this community? Are they going to be there for me in a year from now or two years from now when there's something wrong with the building? And are we going to have a relationship? So they can help me fix it, or they're going to be opposed to me in some sort of way. And so we really focus on about our long-term relationship. So with with people, with clients, and and hope that it's going to be a long-term relationship uh, from the very get-go. Um, and so, uh, our, so I think the m- number one is is looking at first costs instead of final costs. Um, you know, is it the fir- is the first number really a good number, or 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 is it? it or is this how much has this team delivered on this final cost locally, right? With repeated success, and and then if someone's done it with repeated success, and I do have some really good, uh, worthy competition here locally, and also in Tampa, and, and very much so in Dallas, um, that can get work done just as good as we can. Um, and so, when you look at that, that those are the people that the developers should choose from. Um, also, I think. Uh, I think when it comes to making their making, and it all depends on what kind of project it is, but making their mind up in a fashion where they where it's where it can work with a project is super important. When when the, when you change things as you go, it gets extremely more expensive. And what people don't realize is it's like a it's like stopping and starting a train, right? So if you stop something for a change order now, you have to build the momentum back of the train. So if the train was going sixty, you stop it to zero. Oh man. Like that's now this train has to get momentum again. And then you're like, well, I, I made the change a month ago. Oh yeah. But we, well, we lost a month. Right. I mean, I, and, and so people don't understand that, that, uh, I mean, the train analogy is good. And one time I had a developer stop in the middle of COVID because, uh, all of their, all of their, um, kind of their, uh, level, they have a bunch of assets were illiquid but they had some credit against them. And so those, those got called because the assets went, went down in value and they said, okay, you need to stop building. We're like, okay, that's kind of impossible. Right. I mean, it's a huge project. It's a 200 million dollar project. And, and, uh, and so then he said, okay, I have cash again, start. And we're like, it, it, it doesn't work that way. It's like, it's like feeding bird feeders. Like say you had a full bird feeder for months and months and months. And then you know, birds are everywhere. If you just take that bird feeder away for a month, like, and then you put up a new bird feeder out there that has tons of bird feed in it, well, you're not going to get the same amount of birds back in that bird feeder, right? It's going to be a little while. So some people think it's just that easy to get talent and, and momentum back, and it's just not. Um, and then, and then uh, I'd, I'd say those are the, two, the, the three big ones, right? It's, it's what's the final cost? You know, making your mind up early and then just kind of keeping that consistency on the schedule is so important. So important. When should people really start talking to their general contractor if they're doing a big development? When do people call you? And when should people call you? You know, the earlier, uh, the better you start the relationship. So then you can kind of see the thought process, the or- process of the organization that you're working with. Um, and and so I would say as you have your first set of DDs would be the latest. Um, and you know, that, and those are design development drawings that we can start looking at, look at constructability. And so people don't get too far down and too far in love with some sort of detail that they, that they love. Um, and, and so then you can say, okay, you, that, that detail is fine, but it's, it's $2 million on your building. And does that work with the rents you have, or does that work with a condo? You're going to, does all that stuff work? Um, we've had, uh, I've had, I've had best in class, uh, owners that sat in a cold, dark room with our virtual design and construction team for a year, working out every single detail. And I don't, and I'm, I think there was less than 200 change orders on a $175 million job. Um, which is just crazy. Amazing. Uh, great client. Um, does that and, end up being design know, build? Had, 
No, not with a condo. That happened to be a condo. Uh, so, so the uh, the the architect and the engineer still have to sign sign and seal every single document, and they do that through the owner. Um, design, build condos usually uh, you can't get enough liability insurance for those. Um, and, and, you know, to talk about the timing of things we've had as, as late as someone come to us and say, Hey, we need your help to build a, a soccer stadium. And they, uh, and I said, well, wh- when do you want to play soccer? And they said, uh, it was June at the time. They said, well, we want to play, uh, February 20th of next year. I'm like, uh, that's seven months away. And I said, so then I went in full project management mode. Cause I'm a, a recovering project manager. And I said, have you ordered steel? Is it designed? No, no. And, uh, we ended up starting the project two, two weeks later and we finished on time. Unfortunately, they didn't get to play their first game there because of COVID. So, um, but, uh, it was a heck of a project. It was super cool, super fast track. Um, you know, that you have to do those things a little differently. Uh, so it was, it was neat. It was really neat. On something like that. Florida, really want it. Go ahead. Yeah. On something like that, what is your first move? Like what, what are you doing? Someone saying, Hey, we need to build the stadium. What are you doing right away? How do you start? First is we have to check our inventory to see if we have the talent to do it. And if you have the right talent for that project, then you take the assignment. If you don't have the talent, you do not take that assignment. Uh, that will end very badly. Uh, and, a and do as the CEO or the president will be end up spending most of your time there. And then you really don't get to focus on what's important to the business. Um, so we got lucky. We had the right talent, uh, sitting available and we, we put together a team, uh, with other trade, with other contractors. So it was a, it was a tri venture. And so now, now you have to figure out how do you partner well, communicate well, um, and then make sure the risk, um, the risk profile meets the task at hand. And so that owner uh, did a really good job working with us to make sure the risk max matched uh, kind of the reward. And, uh, and, and they kind of kept it simple for us. They did a great, I mean, uh, the Mastec brothers, uh, Jorge and Jose Moss are great people, amazing people. Um, definitely people that I look, look up to in the business world. And it's a beautiful stadium. Uh, for those who haven't been there, this thing was built in a very short amount of time and looks like it was, was planned over years. So when, when we're building buildings now, we're trying to loop in the contractor very early. And back in the day, we used to come up with plans. Maybe they were close to being into CDs. And then we'd start talking to two or three contractors. My approach has changed though to where now I'm bringing in the contractor very early. We're really only talking to one and we're basically aligning ourselves with the group that we respect the most, trust the most, because ultimately the sub pool starts to look very similar in a lot of these markets. Is that what something that you're seeing or am I totally you know, foolish? You might love me. I might be your greatest customer, but... No, no, no. <laughs> um... No, I, I believe that's the right strategy. I think the uh, the costs are going to be the cost. The market will will end up dictating what the costs are going to be. And so, all you're doing is, uh, you know, with your with your most important partnership, all you're doing is trying to you know cut the person by half a percent or one percent. And you know, do you pick do you pick your doctor the same way? I, I guess that's my question. Do you say? Mr. Doctor, I really want to cut one percent from your from from your economic uh, you know gain from this. I don't think anyone picks a doctor that way. Um, so, so the costs are going to be what the costs are because in most markets, that's pretty stabilized about uh, where the trade contractors are. Now, I would say Tampa is a different market. Tampa, you probably only have coverage of one to two trade contractors on each one on each kind of. Uh, each trade and that's tough and it's tough that that means that there's going to be possibilities to where um where the price dramatically increases uh from from maybe your dd set to your cd set because that that was one or two trade contractors that busy and they'll do it but then they're going to make absorbent absorbent amount of money um and you know and maybe your performer works with it still um so i think in in larger markets that's about right in smaller markets it's tough 
stuff. So in those markets where there's only one or two subs that can do it, how do you how do you work with them? Do you bring in subs from other markets? Subs from other markets are going to add cost as well, right? Because you you now because it's not about just the sub itself. Now it's all about all the talent and who's there to to work the space, right? So that's why I think Naples and Fort Myers is an extremely tough place to work. Is because you, you go into Starbucks there, and yep. uh, Jake, you would be look, you would look like a, a senior in high school there, right? So, um, uh, so and I and I and I would look you know like in my mid thirties, but I'm definitely not that. So, um, so so you what we do is we work closely with those trade contractors and with the owners and say, okay, who's got a spot? Now you have to garner a lot of trust from all all aspects in order to start working like this. It means that you have to pay people on time. Uh, that means your owners have to really trust that you're trying to do the best thing you can for them, um, and that's what that's what that that market takes. Um, and uh, and you know if you have the right talent there, it makes a huge difference. And our team over there is super talented, just like all of our teams are. Um, so that's 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 what we do. We try and work with the locals there. Uh, bringing in people is tough. Uh, but there are some people that have traveled there and then done well. Yeah. I want to turn it now back to the business because we kind of just glossed over the fact that you've grown so much and you're so big and you're probably now the largest contractor in South Florida, if not one of them. So as you have, let's take largest the past, the largest in the state. Wow. So as you take the past five years, what's changed in your strategy, what have you adjusted, whether it's asset classes, new business verticals? Yeah. Um, over the past five years, uh, when you look at what our makeup of makeup of the prod or, or of our volume was, was probably 85% South Florida of that, like eight, we were probably $800 million or so. Um, and we had very little solar in that, even though we were in the solar business, but it was more like a hobby. It, we had like 20 people working there trying to figure it out. And we would do a project in Canada or maybe do a project in California. Um, and and um, it, was, it was almost like five years ago that we, we got three big projects in Hawaii. And we wouldn't have, what's, what's amazing about being diverse geographically is we probably would have never done that job in Hawaii if we didn't have a business there. Right. And, uh, and that was a springboard to, uh, solar being quickly a, uh, a billion dollar business, which is, uh, which is pretty amazing, uh, with a third largest in the country as it relates to utility scale solar contract. So it's a, a significant business. Um, so then you start to look at where, how, how, you know, we have, we've maintained or grown in South Florida from that number. So we'll probably do about a billion a, this year of just South Florida alone. And you think about where we are now in Tampa from where we were five years ago, we were probably doing, you know, maybe 60 to 70. Now we're doing 350 million in, 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 in uh, Tampa. And now we, in, and we're doing zero in Dallas. Um, so it's, uh, it's been quite interesting to see. The biggest thing we did was from, um, uh, from a business side is we, we, broke these up and now we have a vision leadership team up top. There's, there's eight, nine people of that. And now we've, we've created those same teams at each level. So now they're running a business. And so quarterly, we look at those business in a very uh, routine way. We call it our rhythm and rigor. So this business, every quarter, we look at every single business. And then we, if we need to adjust strategy as it relates to what's right for the whole business, then we look at it and how can we adjust strategy in these five businesses? Um, it also gets ownership to that level, that uh, senior vice president level and that vice president level to be a part of a business, not just a series of projects. Um, and so that's really helped the business. I think that will help the business go in perpetuity um, as, as we think about it a little bit differently than, than a lot of the contractors think about it. Um, so I think that that's the biggest struck, you know, the biggest change, and uh, and now we do focus on diversity. Like right right now, is a, we just got a uh, a huge airport project uh, at Fort Lauderdale, and we're you know we try and keep a balance in between public and private sector work uh, for times like this when interest rates are going up and inflation's going up, and the and the people that have the money happen to be uh, the people that have been collecting taxes for the past uh, five years. 
right? And you have to keep that resume fresh. So, um, so that's uh, that's a huge win. And and so uh, watching watching that diversity level is is uh, is important. What's the difference between a public job and a private job? I don't, you know, you don't have to say anything spicy. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be a little bit different than the last guest. Um, uh, you know, they both have challenges, right? Uh, so I'll take a public job. We'll end up having, you know, three uh, stakeholder. Right? There'll be three or four stakeholders. When we build that airport, we actually built the Terminal 1 um, here at, 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 at Fort Lauderdale. And you'll walk into a stakeholder meeting and there'll be 15 different stakeholders, right? Everything from the union of all the, all the people working there that's in the, um, uh, that's the desk worker union, right? And then there's the flight people union and then there's the grounds crew union. And then there's, uh, you know, security, the security, right? Then there's BSO, then there's, you know, it, it just goes on and on, right? And, so now you have to communicate with them clearly how you're going to tear up a building and keep everyone safe. And what are you going to do this week? What, what got done last week? What got done, what's going to get done this week? How are you going to keep people safe? How are you going to shut off someone's cafeteria and then you're going to turn it back on? So a lot tougher, right? Um, at the same time, um, you know, there is no performer you have to go to, right? There's no, you have to stay within budget, but there's no, there's nothing in the outside world. The, the, the money's already earmarked. There's nothing in the outside world that's going to cause funding not to happen. So if you follow the rules, the funding's going to happen, right? Um, and private development, uh, you only have really one one stakeholder, right? You have the private developer, um, and and that you get information faster. There's not a lot of you know if if they're available, right? Uh, that's one of the hard parts. Is some some you know, some of these clients are extremely busy and they don't have the infrastructure behind them to make all the decisions. So then they have to be the person to make all the decisions, which is, which gets to be tough. Um, and, um, and so they, and so they, you know, their, their tough part is, you know, if the financial world changes, then they feel like that, well, that means your financial world should have to change too. And that's not our role. I mean, we didn't take that risk, right? We didn't take developer risk. We took contractor risk, which is a little different, right? And so it may get in, in a little bit more unpredictable with payments. Maybe they get a, a more, uh, uh, they'll start to put everyone in harm's way and, and public public sector usually doesn't do that. I have to say that we don't do any U S government work on purpose. Um, so the U S government that? will put people in. Harm. Um, well, when your client can print their own money to pay their lawyers, you know, that's going to be a problem. Right. And, they can also print money so, to pay you though. Well, they rather at some point print money to fight with you. And once, once they do that, uh, that's tough. I think, I think the second toughest uh, client would be, um, uh, would be a newspaper company or some sort of print company that, uh, that, that has ink in their, uh, in their arsenal. So that's tough. You know, I, I think us government's tough. And also they have all these rules that you have to comply with that are, just so tough. Uh, but there's been, there's some people that have made it, made it figure out how they work, but, uh, I don't think we're there yet. So going into COVID, my company culture was definitely really weak. And you were the one, one of the people that I sought out to learn from and seek advice from to grow my business. Not only the relationship between certainly father and son, but also in a business that was growing very quickly and needed to rely on people to help do it. My culture was pretty weak. And I'm fascinated by your Vision Leadership Council. Can we talk a little bit about what they do, what kind of people sit on that, and then how that sets the goals and strategies for everyone in the company? Yeah, that's that's fun. Uh, thank you for asking. That's a compliment, number one. I really do appreciate that. Uh, and there is an old saying that culture, uh, eats, eats strategies lunch. And I, I feel like that, that can definitely happen. If you have the right culture, it doesn't mean you, you can ignore strategy and ignore everything that has to happen there. Uh, it just means it's really hard to do it with people that aren't aligned as it relates to what's important and what's not important. Um, 
So the leadership team is made up of four presidents and uh, four chiefs. And so that is chief legal, uh, chief information, uh, chief human resource officer, and chief financial officer. Four presidents are one has uh, solar, one has South Florida, one has Tampa and our Tampa and Dallas, and then one's a scaling officer. Uh, we pulled him out of South Florida because uh, solar was going to have to scale so fast. Is that he is helping us figure out how do we scale that business in a significant way and quickly and honor our values. Um, and so the team really meets once a month offsite, uh, for four to six hours, uh, in, in that day. And we don't look over, um, spreadsheets. We don't look over financials. What we look for is what culturally is happening in the business to make sure it needs to be what it needs to be three years from now. Right. So we, then we look at by business, by business, by business. And then we look at what's supporting the business. Is that going to make sure it like, like we had a huge transformation. We're doing through an HR transformation right now, uh, where we're going to install workday and, and, and be able to keep track of our people's progress better than we have before. Um, and so all those decisions culturally are made from the vision leadership team. Then it's communicated and cascaded down to the, to each regional leadership team or in, in solar's case, they have a solar strategy team and it cascades down. Then each one of those groups um, make and set their visions for their group with their goals and what their kind of market share is going to be. And then if the market share is going to be that big, then how big of an organization? So we first start with strategy, then we start with structure. And then we get to people. A lot of time what people do is, um, and this, this is one of my favorite uh, mentors, she taught me this. Um, sometimes they start with people first. And then they figure out what the structure is going to be, who's going to report to who, and then we're going to we're going to go out to market with our strategy. Well, the market doesn't care about your strategy. Like they're not looking. The market's not looking for a new strategy from a construction company. They don't care, right? What you have to do is go backwards, right? What's the values of the business? What's the mission of the business? Then what's our strategy to get that done with the market knowledge of where we are and how big you can be and all that stuff. What's that strategy first? Then you go to structure. Then you start to have hard conversations with people you may have that may not fit the structure, but there's a good place for that person, right? Um, and that keeps it so much more objective than subjective um, as it relates to, you know, people. Um, and then once you have the people down, you actually go to process last. And it's something people don't realize is you go to process and systems last once you have the right people in the right, right boxes. So that's what that team does on a constant basis. Uh, we learn together um, and uh, we've, the core group has been together since 2011, 2012. Um, so now it's, it's uh, 10, you know, 12, 12 years old. Um, if any, you know, I don't know if members or, or people listening are in YPO, but we, we start the, that four to six hour meeting checking in with each other in YPO fashion. Uh, we do, we do uh, exercises to make sure that we show up as human beings and not just human doings. And uh, so there's some deep relationships that are built in, in, in yeah, they're, they're built at the vision leadership team and at the, and at the strategy teams. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to be a part of. Okay. So what does a check-in look like then? People are, you're checking in with someone's personality and their family, and then you're kind of turning to the business side? Most of the time we check on them personally, professionally, and family. And, you know, we ask them to give a number to it so we can understand where they are. And if they have a three-minute check-in, that would be great. Uh, once a year, we do uh, the Wheel of Life, where each one of these wheel, each one of these is a, is a, is a you know, where are you at spiritually, where are you at vocationally, where are you at money, where are you at um, energy, where are you at physically? Um, marriage, family, um, and, it, and so then you kind of see how how odd shaped your wheel is, or maybe your wheel is in balance, um, and that gives people a perspective of when you're talking to them, and when you check in that way, you know where they are mentally. So if someone has maybe a sick child, right, you know that that person mind is someplace else. So you need to give that person some deference and care for where they are mentally, right. Um, 
you know, or maybe they know that you have, they have a tough job and that's where their mind is. Right. So you need to give some care and deference for where they are there. Um, you know, at the same time, the, and what it also does is it makes everyone realize that everyone's got stuff. Like no one's living a perfect life. Right. And so everyone's got stuff. Um, and so the more vulnerable that group gets, the deeper their relationships get and the more care they have uh, for each other. And I would say the, the biggest thing we're doing with those check-ins is we're building this level of trust, which is the basis for all great teams. Um, and I'm a huge Patrick Lencioni fan. And so it starts with trust because then what the next thing we go into is what you talked about is we're going to the business. Now there's going to be some conflict, right? I may believe it should be done one way. You may believe it should be done another way. And so it's really without trust, conflict is politics. Uh, and we just don't do politics, right? So without that deep layer of trust, you got to have conflict because then you have to move to the next stage and what's that's commitment. And so when that team of nine walks out of the, walks out of the room, um, we're all committed to exactly the play we're running and everyone's singing off the same sheet of music. Right. And so then we can hold each other accountable. If someone doesn't run the right play, it's fine. We just hold each other accountable or, and then eventually that ends up the results. And this is where I think, you know, publicly traded companies have a really hard time. I don't know how leadership does it there because, you know, publicly traded companies start with results. Then they're going to hold people somewhat accountable. Someone's getting fired or promoted and they really never get to commitment, right? Because it stops right there, right? When you kind of think about the triangle and so they never get the trust, right? And, and, and I can't imagine what it's like to lead some of those companies. Um, it's going to be tough, um, but they figure it out. Uh, so that's what we focus on. It's that trust then conflict and commitment. And, you know, fortunately I have to do a lot of accountability and, and the results kind of just kind of happen. So. In your role, inevitably maybe trust gets broken. Is that something that you found you can repair or is that not repairable? It's it, it, uh, one of our processes is issue clearance. And so when you clear issues as they come up, it can be repaired. If you let three, four, five, six issues happen, then you now have a personal issue with the person and it's going to be much harder to repair. Um, and so those issue clearances are way better if you take the time and issue clear as, as it happens. Uh, that way you're not telling yourself a story of what happened and you're letting your mind free. We do issue clearances as a check-in. Um, because if there's something going on between two people, then they need to make sure that they're clear because we're working on the business. You know, we don't need whatever your personal grievance is with the person to get in the way of that. Um, so, uh, that's, that's my thought process. And, uh, you know, at some point, if there's a level of trust that's been broken that you can't get over, you'll start to know it and you'll start to figure out that, Hey, that person needs a, needs a second chance, needs, needs to humanely leave the organization. And that doesn't mean you don't just, dis, you dislike the person, just they're not going to get a fair shot here. And we're not going to, and, and, and so they not, they're not going to be able to get to their goals. So how do you do that in a humane way? And we work on that. We, you know, we, uh, it's, it's hard to do, but, uh, we do work on that. Uh, what the one the one cue I think you can never recover from is when someone has contempt for one another, and once contempt goes into the kind of the the the, the relationship, there's no recovery from that. And how do you view your role as the leader of the company on this vision leadership council? Well, if you uh, if you sat in a meeting, uh, I hope that you couldn't tell uh, who was the CEO and who wasn't. Um, I'm, I'm a part of the vision, vision leadership team. We walk in there as equal, equal people in the business. Um, and so, you know, my, my eventual status in that, in that organiz in that group is to constantly be ahead of where the business is from a visionary standpoint, making sure that everyone understands the, if we make these choices today, this is where we're going to end up in the future as it relates to are we okay with being that size of an organization or working in those areas or doing that kind of work? Um, and you know, I, I view myself more now as someone who's helping 
people learn big business. And so a lot of my, a lot of what I do is I try and learn as much as I can so I can teach as much as I can back into the organization. Um, so I think CEOs end up being, of larger organizations end up being teachers. Um, and so uh, I spend a decent amount of time learning. And how do you teach culture at your company to that team and then make sure it passes down now that your company is growing so quickly? In 2015, 2016, we got together and we made our core values. And you say, well, how did you have, core, you didn't have core values from, from, from 2003, 2004? Not really. We had non-negotiable standards, which is like a long list of things. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, I, I, I had lost my way of why am I going to work, wake up and work this hard and, you know, for what, um, obviously to get paid and all that stuff. Yes. And, and so these core values ignited me. So I feel like they're going to ignite any other people. And that's, uh, honor relationships, uh, entrepreneur spirit and, and contagious energy. And, um, and so these are really clear to people. And so then people know them by the sentence that describes them. That's how well people know them here is uh, on a relationship is care about the safety, well-being and success of our families and business partners. And so you say, well, that sounds like everyone else's on a relationship, but the well-being is different, right? Now, well-being is not to just someone show up to work. Are they okay? Mentally, are they okay? Can they do the tasks they need to do today? Can they be present? And is it, no, it's this a holistic kind of approach to caring about people. Um, and in our families and business partners, meaning, you know, you're not just thinking about the people inside this company, but you think about everybody you touch. Right. Um, so it, it, and then, you know, when people are doing it really well, when they go just maybe a little too far, Hey, I really helped out this person. Okay. That's great. You did maybe a little too far help, but, but fine. We're to go, we're good with it. Um, entrepreneurial spirit is, uh, overcome challenges, uh, embrace opportunities and innovate. And so when people ask, are you always going to grow? Um, entrepreneurial spirit says that, uh, you embrace opportunities. If you're going to shrink, you have to unembrace opportunities. Um, so the more opportunities we get, you know, the, the more we're going to end up growing, which then honors relationships because it gives people kind of a career path here. And then lastly, contagious energy, which is an ohm to my father. If you, if you spend any time around him, he's got tons of energy for a 75 year old man. Uh, and he's, uh, he's always upbeat. And so you're, and it's described in a very simple phrase, work hard because you're in construction and you're, it's going to be long hours, be nice and have fun. Right. And, and those three kind of, you know, really help people realize that you can be nice to people in this business, which I think some people miss out on sometimes. And so those three, um, end up kind of summing up who we are, which then this, which goes to our core purpose. And our core purpose is, uh, is empowered to create the exceptional, meaning each person is empowered at their level to create the exceptional experience for the client, for the people they work with or for trade contractors. And it doesn't mean you give away money and you know, all that stuff. But you create an except you, you you make it exceptional for people, and you know you get more and more people on board with that uh, with that vision. Um, so that helps kind of having that framework really clearly that where I where I can say it in you know what two minutes, um, then it's repeatable. It's repeatable, right? Um, so that's that's how I that's how we broke it down. Then we it's a constant reminder. Uh, of, of how we behave. Uh, we haven't had to change it in, uh, in seven years. So, uh, so I think it's stuck. It took six, took six months to get to those words though. I mean, it was, uh, hotly debated every, every the and a was hotly. Debated. They're beautiful. I love it. It's, uh, people underestimate how hard it is to come up with your values. In fact, like when we were going through all these cultural issues during COVID, we came up with our mission and vision and we still don't really have values. Like, I think I put values up on the website, but I kind of just, you know, made them up as a placeholder. What my next main focus is, is creating these core values, because I actually think it's way important than the mission and vision, because these are what the people in your company are going to use to make decisions and act and approach problems and solutions way more so than I want to be the, uh, you know, the greatest hotel company in the world. 
Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. And, and, and when, when people are forced with a decision, those values would end up really informing them what's the right decision to make. Yeah. Right. And then at what point do I need to push this forward? And then what it'll quickly also, people will self select, which is great, which is great. Cause if you're, if you're attracting everyone, you're, you're attracting no one. Right. And so the people that are on board for these values will live them and breathe them because they feel honored. They get to work in a place like that. Um, and that's huge, right? Cause now you have a, a, a you know, a person that's going to use these as their value set to make decisions. Um, that's great. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, you know, if you need help, brother, let me know. I'm, I'm coming help. to you. It, no doubt. You've helped me in so many ways. <laughs> that's Maybe you can inspire me with this other, where I want to go to next, because it seems like in order for you to have built this big company, you figured out the right cadence. You meet monthly with your vision leadership team. What what meetings are you attending on kind of a daily, weekly, monthly basis to make sure that you have the pulse of the business without just being in meetings every single day? Like, I know you love me, but I don't know that if we were building a building together, you'd be at my OAC meeting. No, I, w- I would not. Uh, I actually got asked this question today uh, from a developer. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was fun. Uh, it was kind of fun because he was a he 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 was an old uh, he's an old contractor that ended up becoming a developer, and then they sold the contracting firm, and now he's just a developer. And now he's like, "How, how much are you involved in these businesses or in each one of these projects?" I said, "Well, there's seventy going on, so um, you know, not not much." Um, and the idea is that you again you have to empower the people that work with you right? To get to the spot to where they're making the decisions. And then you have to have the systems uh, and the cadence to really look at the decisions from a long-term basis. Um, now, there, there are some deals I end up sitting in when we're crafting the final deal where they want to meet someone that the last name Moss. Um, and so I'll sit in those final final negotiations and discussions. Uh, and I tell them, I hope, I hope I'm, I'm here for two things, uh, the groundbreaking and the ribbon cutting. And, and if I have to walk the, and if, if you want me to walk the project with you, you know, once a quarter, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but most likely the team that's here taking care of you is empowered to make any decision that you need. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, they, they do exactly that. Now, if there's an issue, um, we always run to the fire. Uh, if there's an issue, um, I will walk probably a project, uh, a week. So four in a month or so. And, uh, Luckily, I don't get called to walk many projects by owners. Um, so uh, our team is really doing a fantastic job of, of making sure we're performing great. What the project, the, the meetings I attend weekly is um, we have a Monday morning staff meeting where it's the top 60 people that quickly give an idea of snapshot of anything that happened last, year, last week and a snapshot of what's going to happen this week. Uh, then we rotate who's taking turns going more in depth. Maybe finance is going more in depth one week and maybe it is going more in depth one week. And then maybe HR is going more in depth one week. So then they rotate. So they don't take up too much airtime. And I hear more from operators than I hear from, than I hear from, uh, the, the people, the, the back of house people that meeting takes about 45 minutes and, uh, and we're in and out of that in 45 minutes. Wow. Um, we do 60 people. Yeah. 45 minutes, 60 people. So, so everyone had, and, and th- so about half are listening to know what's going on and they don't need to report in. And then maybe every other week they'll report in because their jobs are different. Then after that, we do a VLT tactical. So there's some tactical thing is like, okay, who's going to this event? Who's going to this event? Who's got this? Who's, you know, that happens. And that's like 45 minutes as well. So first hour and a half of Monday starts. And then I don't, I don't attend anything else weekly. Uh, and then once a month, vision leadership team, once a quarter QBRs. And then we, um, I do a CFO update or CEO update for, for all anybody that wants to get on zoom. And so I give them a quick snapshot of the business for 20 to 30 minutes. And I answer open mic questions for 700, 800 people for as long as it takes to get off the phone, to get off, to get off zoom. How often Um, was that happy? uh, I do that three times a year. Every time. Oh. And it usually is about an hour and a half. 
and uh, it's super fun. Uh, they give me a hard time, which is great, and uh, ask me what my favorite color is, pizza. They also ask me tough questions like, what do you think about the Ukraine conflict? <laughs> and uh, how do you think that'll affect the business? So, uh, I, yeah, I have to be well versed on a lot of, uh, of wow like, world subjects when I when I go into here. Like the president, you have and, talking uh, points. Yeah, wow, well, <laughs> better. <laughs> um, and then uh, then we do planning meetings where we get the top sixty people in the same room and then kind of talk about the business, uh, and then talk about give them a learning moment have them connect with each other from a personal level. Uh, cause I think it's important when you're collaborating together to get together. Um, so that's a fun meeting too. Yeah. So a lot of a more, more once a month than once a week meetings. So then on a weekly basis, where is most of your brain power being spent wow. other than drinking um, Schaefer 1.5? <laughs> there you go. Schaefer's going to love all these plugs. Um, yeah, they're a sponsor. Uh, I, I think most of my time is kind of equally spent in between, um, you know, s- wow, that's a hard question. I, I, I'd have to write it, start writing some of this down. You know, I would probably say 25% is deep into visioning what the next version of Moss is that Moss, 8.0 version. We're at Moss 7.0 right now after 20 years. And then where, where does that 8.0, if we're going to be at eight, if, if 8.0 equals X, you know, it equals a $4 billion business with, you know, each, each shape and size looking like this, what do I need to make sure in the background is ready to take on that scale? Right. Cause you have to have the foundation in order to have that kind of a business on it. And so I find myself now spending more time figuring out, um, what kind of balance sheet are we going to have? What would the income statement look like? And then what, what are the, what are the ramifications of those things on, on our bonding capacity, on our banking, all, all of that, uh, starts to have a bigger in, you know, uh, an influx into this business. And one of the things, hard things about a trade contractor, and it's very much like a, or, or, or a trade contractor or contractor is you fall in love with business and then quickly you realize I don't get to build very much anymore. Um, and so you, you have to have this whole business attitude about, about this business that I, you know, that's not very seen to people. Um, so that's probably 25%. And, uh, probably the other 25% is helping, helping our solar team scale, uh, from a CEO perspective of, uh, does this look like the right strategy and the right structure, um, to continue to, to go forward? Um, the other 50% ends up being a, you know, how, how do I make this a great place to work? So I spend 50% of my time on how do I make this a great place to work? Um, with, you know, as I, as I told that developer today is, you know, you, you may like me and, and hopefully he does. And, and, you know, you'll be excited to have a person with a Moss shirt, uh, that's working on your, on your, on your project. But at the end of the day, you really care about the person in the shirt because that's the guy who's showing up every day to build your project. And so you care less about the name on the shirt and more about the person in the shirt. Well, my job is to get the best people in our shirts at the end of the day. And I feel, I feel like if you give people a, a, a lot of dignity and care for them greatly, then you'll get the best people in your shirts. And so that's... Uh, that's 50% of my time is figuring out how do we make this a great place? How do we keep it a great place? How do we scale it to make it a great place? How do I, how do we make sure everyone has a great career here? And if they don't have a great career here, then how do we help them have a great, great career someplace else? So that's a little different take. Let's talk about the solar business. Is that going to be something that becomes bigger than the construction business? You know, our goal is never to be big. Our goal is to be significantly proud of uh, the products that we put out, and uh, and if our people with entrepreneurial spirit make it grow because they've embraced opportunities, then then we're in on that. Um, so, you know, we as a contractor, you're only the tail, right? The dog and the demand is is by something else, and so when you look at the demand of solar uh, as a and and the world has a significant appetite for solar. And, uh, and I've read a couple of articles from the economists about how, how this latest conflict in the world is driving green energy quickly. Um, and it's, uh, and also this latest, uh, 
Inflation Reduction Act um, has fueled on, uh, sorry for the pun, fueled on even more uh, to the demand of solar. And so if we had access to more panels right now, um, we are the demand for solar would probably be three times as much as it is today. But right now, we are trying to figure out which panels are good out of China and which panels aren't good out of China as far as it relates to the um, uh, the auction case that that, is, that, that puts on uh, a 240% tariff if the wafers came from a certain part of China. And so, so they have to figure that out over the next year or two years. And once we figure that out with how much money has been put in the IRA for solar, um, we can see that that business is going to triple in the next three or four years. And so if that is the case, then the markets that we're in would probably not triple as it relates to CM. And so there's a possibility that that, pro- that, 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 that business could be the same size or bigger than the CM business. Um, and it, uh, it makes no difference to us at the end of the day, if it is or isn't. A lot of people are concerned about China, obviously, and what they might do and what the U.S. government might do with regards to imports. How are you thinking about that in relation to your business? And maybe let's put some context to this because I don't think people understand how big this business is. Like Scott is not putting solar panels on people's houses. I mean, you are putting solar panels across fields that are hundreds of acres, right? Yeah, thousands of acres in some places. Uh, you know, three and four thousand acres. Um, our team, uh, our team happens to be, uh, our leadership team happens to be in Arizona today, where it's close to thirty-eight hundred acres in in uh, on American lands that uh, is is was designated for for utility scale solar. Um, so, uh, and, and then it ends up happening is uh, a battery pack actually gets attached to that solar plant. So any, any stuff that's not taken up or any electrical that's not taken up from the grid, it charges those batteries. So when the sun goes down those, and people, the, the, when people come home is when the largest load of, of electrical happens, right? So people come home, they turn down a thermostat, they get the stove working, they get everything going, they get the TVs on all that, all that surge happens in. And I see the sun's going down at that time. So that you need the batteries to kind of boost people's power to, you know, from five to eight. I say, as they do wash and they do everything else. Um, I never thought I'd be in a business where I have to watch geopolitical, geo, geopolitics, but now I, I watch geopolitics pretty closely. It's not just, um, it's not just a solar business. I mean, the, the panels are really important. Um, and so, yes, it has a huge effect. And so we're watching that extremely closely. Uh, and I think with the panels, we have a more desire to have green energy so we're not going to mess with that that uh, issue. Eighty percent of the panels come out of China. Now, over the next three or four years, we're going to be building our own panel manufacturers and wafer plants. So we'll see how U.S. does that. Um, but China has been kind of keen to keep all of those tools to build those things on their side of the pond, right? So we're going to see how this kind of works out. Um, so, uh, so more to come. And so we watch it closely and we know that we'd have to massively scale down that business if, if there's no, no panels to build, because, uh, I think 7% or seven or 8% comes in the U S. So there's really no solar, solar generation constructing going on. Uh, if, if there's no panels from China, um, then if you look at the broader construction business, I mean, most of your elevator parts most of your um, electrical parts, a lot of your plumbing parts, all that stuff comes from China, right? Or, or a vast majority, let's just say. Um, and, and as we're onshoring here, uh, chips really fast, chip manufacturing, which I find really interesting that we're going to build a bunch of chip manufacturing plants. And I'm like, well, at 3.4% unemployment, who's going to work in a chip manufacturing plant? I mean, you could build it and, where are the people going to come from? So I think immigration will be the next hot issue that someone's got to solve. Um, and so I look at I look at the China relations as very very key to the overall economic success of our business. That's very something I track a lot. Both businesses, both businesses, yeah. 
Yeah, without material, it's really hard to finish projects. Any kind. So, you. I don't, I don't really want to, I think solar is almost like a platform shift. Like you were early to that movement, to that trend. Are you seeing anything else in kind of your verticals, your industry, your area that you think is a big shift that's happening right now in construction or energy utilities? Green hydrogen may be the only thing I would say would be uh, a platform shift. And then what you have to have with because these green hydrogen plants take a ton of electrical is you have to have a solar plant kind of powering the drink green hydrogen. That's the only way to kind of get the net zero on that. Then that store of energy, because they end up, it ends up, um, we're going to do something out about it. it, ends up liquidating from, um, oh gosh, I, the word name just escaped me, but it, it goes to liquid state. And so they can transport that energy. Um, and it's green, something that would burn green. Um, and so I think that's a huge shift that can, that will be interesting as we try and export power to places like Europe, that's going to have expensive power. And I think Europe has a bigger challenge than we do because a lot of their manufacturing is going to, has been, has had cheap power for the past 20 years. Now they're looking at very expensive power for the next 20 years. And so how does that manufacturing uh, keep happening there? Um, so that's going to be an interesting geopolitical issue too. So if we can, as, as America can be a great exporter of power, if we can get green hydrogen, right. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty big shift that can happen. Uh, you know, but I, I think, um, I think a lot of people, I think there's a lot of trends out there that I don't necessarily subscribe to. I think people love prefab. People are in love with the idea of prefabbing. I think it has a lot of challenges. Um, and and people will underestimate the amount of capex that has to go into projects that have that are prefab, and they don't realize you have to pay for the factory. At, you know, once once the factory's finished, and if the factory's not busy, someone's got to pay that bill, and then someone's got to pay the workers that are skilled. And you know, it's a prefab. I think is a very tough, tough uh, economic model in construction. A lot of people are doing it in hospitality prefab. They're like doing bathrooms or they're building whole hotel rooms and they come in almost like a container and they just stack them up. Uh, one group I know in California just did it, but you think it's more of, it, it'll evolve back to traditional construction. You don't think that's a permanent trend that's here to stay? Well, how many hotels have the same standards? Well, my my view honestly is that standardized commodity hotels are actually really going to start to fade away. I mean, you, you're always going to have these transactional kind of, it's almost like workforce housing, but real hotels that generate the big amount of the cash flow that people care about are not standardized at all. And in fact, you know, the bathroom's not standardized, nothing standardized about it. Yeah. So it's it really hard to do it when you don't have a standard set of, of kind of criteria. Right. Uh, so um, I think, I think it, hospitals, you know, if, if you start to build a lot of hospitals, it makes a lot of sense. Um, we have built prisons that have been modulized and that, that really works. You know, just the hard, the hard part is, is you have to pay the exorbitant cost of all that CapEx is sitting there ready to build a prefab something. And some, someone has to absorb that CapEx somewhere because they can't do it for the same price with a guy who just brings in materials and puts it together. Just can't be done. Um, so it, you're going to find some of that stuff in San Francisco and New York, where where wages have gotten so high that it makes sense to, to prefab stuff. It just doesn't seem like it, it works in our markets yet. Um, one of the big platform changes, I think, is demographic change. Like how many people are moving to the areas that we happen to live in and happen to be in. Um, it's just fascinating to see how much annual income has moved from one area to the next area and what's the dramatic shift that's happened and i think that's one of the reasons why our markets stay extremely high so are people going to keep moving to condos and apartments or do you think these single family rental models are going to absorb a lot of that growth right now we're doing two single family rentals in dallas I don't know if they work in South Florida because the land's so expensive. 
And the only reason, the only way you can get the, the return out of it is you build density. And so I think in South Florida, the, the people will be moving into rentals or condos, right? Cause that, that's the only way you can get this many people piled into here. Um, Tampa, I think is in the same, same spot too. They don't, unless you go North and South of Tampa a good bit, um, really hard to do single family rentals. And so the density is what ends up driving that. But uh, in Dallas, it, it's, it's working. And, and that's a whole new trend. And we have two or three clients that are they're doing that. And it uh, seems like it's written out pretty good. Some fascinating numbers about uh, like 60 to 70% are women that end up uh, renting those. And uh, 70% are, home, are, are, are pet owners. Right, because you think about having a pet inside of an apartment, like wow, that's a pain. Every time you have to go to the bathroom, you have to walk downstairs in an elevator. So, yeah. it's, it's really the new way. How how things? Are. Yeah, it yeah. is. You want a dog? Um, one thing I know you've thought a lot about, and I, I think it would be a kind of a good place to to end it, is legacy and family, and and we touched on it a little bit, but you're building this as a generational business. How, how do you think about that? How does that work? Are you building it for a Moss last name has to be president chairman? Or are you not thinking about it that way? Or do you not want to answer? I don't know. Uh, I have no problem answering. Um, I, my job is to make sure a leadership team can communicate with a board about what's important to the business and where it's, where it's heading. Right. And I think I have that leadership team kind of totally intact right now. Then you have to have a board willing to listen and understand what the leadership team's saying and help the leadership team make the decision, make sure that they're making all the right decisions from a board perspective. And so I'm halfway there on that. Uh, as I continue to work on that. And then at that point, you know, a Moss doesn't have to be sitting in the seat, like the leadership teams, not just the top one, but the, all of the other ones will start to be trained in this fashion to, to communicate up what's important. And then that way the board can, can say, yes, that, that makes sense. And then continue forward. Right. Um, and then, you know, I, I, the hope is my son or my daughters get to do whatever uh, they want to do. And if, if, their hope and dream is that they want to work inside the business. Um, then they have to do all the entrepreneurial spirit, the contagious energy and on a relationships, just like everyone else. Um, that usually means that you have to be in the finite this business. You have to understand the, the day to day of the business because you don't want to be sitting at a, at a level inside the organization that doesn't know the finite and you start making these decisions that affect the finite. Um, unless you know it, uh, so you can tell I'm a big Simon Sinek fan. Um, and, and so, uh, so if, if that's one of their choices to do that, I, I would love for them to work in the business. Uh, cause it's a beautiful place. Uh, there's great people here. Um, at the same time, that contagious energy means you have to work hard, be nice and have fun. Right. And that's someone from a lot, the last name of Moss, uh, it does not matter. Uh, you still have to behave in those value sets. Um, so, Fortunately, all my kids are are, are awesome. Um, one is uh, studying at NC State in fashion and and uh, and textile management. She's gonna be working for Derek Lamb this summer uh, as an intern. So um, yeah, that's kind of cool. I'm so ho. And uh, my son is a construction major at at Santa Fe Community College. Wants to transfer into the University of Florida and graduate from there. And then, uh, my daughter is an artist. My last daughter is an artist. And so she would be a great salesperson though. She's really awesome. Uh, so good times. I want to let in with one thing. I, um, I, I've been studying with Boris. Did you have Boris Groisberg at your OPM? Yeah. So I, I actually went with you to an event. So Boris is a Harvard professor. And uh, that's what Scott is referring to. So tell me. Each year I go to uh, Harvard YPO and he surveys us as, uh, as a group. Um, and he surveys us as, as teams. And what he is getting after, after Harvard has done all this research about what is good 
what are the four most important things for sustained business success? So I'm going to read them to you. Uh, one, a clear, well-communicated strategy. Uh, two, simple structure, easily communicated. Three, consistent execution that meets the customer expectations. We can unpack that one in a second. And then four, connect strategy to culture, right? Um, and if you do those four, those are sustained. And then you have to have one of the last... You have to have either a great leader or superior talent, driven innovation in your industry, or develop strong mergers and partnership capabilities. So you have to have four, the top four, and then you have two of those last four. So I think one of the most important things people, you know, don't realize when you start a business is that's for sustained business for a long term period. You can start a business just on superior talent, right? That's only going to take you so far. Right. And that's a little bit how Moss 0.0 started. Moss 1.0 started is we had great talent. And then, and then what did, once you get to a certain level, you're like, okay, where do we go here? There is no strategy. There's really no com- well communicated structure. Right. And so those four simple things, right, will really help entrepreneurs think about how do I have sustained business success? That's just, if that's what you want, if you're playing an infinite game, if you're playing a finite game, Get some people together, run up some revenue, and sell it, right? And that's a strategy too. And there's no judgment in that, right? Um, uh, that's that's one way to go. Um, so that's one one of the things I had kind of sitting here. I thought I would share with you. And and Boris is awesome. So, well, you're awesome. You're at a whole nother level. Okay. So of those four things, this is the last question. What was the turning point for you? Which one do you think had the biggest impact on where you are today? Wow. Connecting strategy to culture. Right. I think, I think once you get people uh, connected into those values and then you can clearly tell them what the strategy ends up being and everyone knows a play to run, it goes much, it goes amazingly. And then, and then, you have somebody who's joined your organization for two years can can tell you exactly what this what strategy of the business is. Just imagine how they can make a difference in your organization. Um, and they're not they're not sitting at the top level. Maybe they're middle management, but if they can tell you what the strategy is in the business, they can help every day. Um, hugely helpful. Amazing. I ask all of my guests the same closing question. I'm going to ask it to you. You're a man well traveled. I don't know. Maybe you know it. Maybe you don't know it. But what is your favorite hotel? The Palace in St. Moritz. The Palace in St. Moritz in the winter or the summer? Summer. Summer. Okay. Uh, you might get you might have given me my uh, summer travel idea. Here we go. Oh, it, it, the hiking is insane. That I mean hiking in Colorado Rockies is beautiful. This is next level stuff. Next level. I mean and and the people are super nice. Yeah, I, I would definitely go and check out the palace. It's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Scott Moss, thanks for joining me on Masters of Moments. I appreciate you. Oh, it's an honor to be here, brother. You have a good one. Hey, everyone. It's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice. Mm-hmm.